Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great crowd. We thank you so much. We have decided this for this season to move from Wednesday mornings to Saturday afternoons, and I think the attendance here is a good indication of the time, but also of the subject. <laughs> so my name is Lynn Ann Polite, and I'm the gallery director here at Vashon Center for the Arts. And today is the first in our series for the 2023 to 2024 Talks on the Rock series. Um, we have some great talks scheduled, including many, a few, a few more, I guess five more, four more with Rebecca, which are always fabulous, some music history ones and environmental talks. Uh, the talks are sold individually or you can buy an all access pass. We're not gonna do the punch card like we did last time. It's an all access for $100. So if you do the math and you come to all eight, it drops the price down to $12 each. So you can just figure out if that's what you wanna do. The schedule of that will be forthcoming. You can also buy the pass, but they haven't been printed yet. So you'll get one though, we'll know. I wanna always be sure to thank our talk sponsor, Ellen Kritzman and Tom and Ida Gay Nicolino. Because of their support, we can have these talks, so we like to give them a round of applause. <laughs> and that's it for me, so here's Rebecca. Oh, it's so nice to see this auditorium full again. Katsushika Hokusai's Great Wave is easily the most famous work of Japanese art, recognizable around the world and around the bicep of a Vashon Center for the Arts employee, uh, which I just saw today. Um, it is Japan's Mona Lisa or Statue of David. And like those artworks, it has been subject to endless reverence, reworking, and yes, parody. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking, but this is from the May 2016 G7 summit in Tokyo. <laughs> and the bloody idiot in question is Boris Johnson. <laughs> um, Right now at Seattle Art Museum, there is a fabulous exhibition of Hokusai works called Inspiration and Influence, drawn from largely from the collection of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which has a superb collection of Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, but the organizers of the exhibition also want us to think about works that we might not have connected to Hokusai as works that have been influenced by the Great Wave and other Hokusai works. Uh, but I won't be talking about that part of the exhibition today because Hokusai himself is so rich. Uh, now, we generally associate Hokusai with the Japanese color woodblock print, of which he was such a magnificent proponent, particularly with the landscape print that he helped bring into being. But Hokusai's career, like Michelangelo's, spanned some 70 years. So it's impossible to encapsulate in just a few images. So today I'm going to try to give you an idea of the whole arc of Hokusai's career and why it was such an important one. And also for the late bloomers among you, um, how nearly all of Hokusai's recognizable famous works were made after he turned 70. Hokusai was born in 1760 in Edo, modern day Tokyo, and was born into an artisan class family. So at, the, at a young age, had to go to work and at 12 uh, became a delivery boy in one of Edo's 600 lending bookshops, uh, of which he would later make this charming image of just such a shop, which also um, has woodblock prints as part of its merchandise, as you'll see here. Then from the age of 14 to 18, 
He apprenticed as a woodblock carver. So we'll talk about the technique in just a moment, uh, but he was the person who was carving another artist's designs into the cherry wood blocks with which Japanese woodblock prints are printed. So he knew the carving process in a way that most of his contemporaries did not. Uh, in fact, he was quite severe with some of the carvers he would later work with when they were not up to his standards. And then at the age of 18, Hokusai entered the studio of Katsukawa Shunsho as an apprentice quite late as an apprentice. Most started around the age of 12. Here's this 18-year-old. Uh, so he was never fully accepted by his fellow apprentices. Nevertheless, he was given the artistic name Katsukawa Shunro by his master, whom we see here, Katsukawa Shunsho, who was most famous for his images of actors. Uh, several of which you can see right now at Seattle Asian Art Museum in the Renegade, Edo, and uh, um, Montmartre exhibition, uh, the uh, Toulouse-Lautrec exhibition. So Shunsho um, was really the first woodblock artist to make his actors recognizable, not just by the roles that they were playing, but by their facial features, like uh, the hooked nose and slightly crossed eyes of Ichikawa Danjuro V. And so Hokusai, entering this studio, began to make actor prints as well, as with the Elizabethan stage, all roles in the Kabuki theater at this time were played by men. So this is an actor um, playing a female role as a courtesan. Uh, but here we see Don Juro the fifth again, that same actor we saw Shunsho portraying. Uh, but here in Shunro or Hokusai's representation. Now, one scholar has called Hokusai's actor prints of his Shunro period, quote, usually only barely competent, end quote. In other words, Hokusai was not a child prodigy. Um, he had a lot to learn uh, and he would develop fairly slowly over the course of his career. Um, but he would learn in Shunsho's studio not just to design woodblock prints, but also to paint on silk, on rice paper in a traditional fashion in a time when many woodblock print designers only did that. They did not paint. They merely designed prints. So what is a Japanese woodblock print? Well, it's a relief print. If you've ever cut a potato in half and carved away part of the potato to, um, to then dip in paint or ink and stamp, you've made a relief print. So with relief printing, what you carve away will not hold the ink, it will not print. So it will be your negative space. What you leave untouched in your carving, that's what will be inked and will be printed. So this is a very rare survival from Hokusai Shunro period of a design for a fan print that was never executed. Because had it been executed, this would have been destroyed. So the original design here, ink on paper, is made on very, very thin, transparent paper, and then it is placed upside down onto a cherry wood block, uh, as we see in this triptych by Utagawa Kunisada, executed after Hokusai's death, but the process had not changed. Uh, so you, you reverse your drawing, because in the printing process, the image is reversed. So for instance, if there is a new text, it moves things on backwards. Um, so it is printed in the proper orientation. 
Uh, so the, um, the drawing is glued face down onto a cherry wood block. And then everything but those lines are painstakingly carved away with very sharp tools. So this woman is sharpening the, um, the knives, the gouges used in the process. This one is carving what we call the key block, just the outlines, usually printed in black. Once that key block is carved, it can be inked and printed, and it would be printed as many times as there would be colors in your print. A print like this could have up to 20 color blocks. So it would be um, inked, the, 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 um, the black and white one would be, would be printed, say, 20 times. And then each of those 20 prints um, would be, again, pasted to the cherry wood block to create the color blocks. So on each one, Hokusai or the uh, Kunisada would indicate, OK, um, this will be our red block. Here, you know, here are the parts of this block that will be red. Everything else from this block you need to carve away. So in this particular block, the reds would be that brush handle, um, uh, the inner kimono here, uh, these areas of text, a uh, bit of hem here. Uh, everything else would be gouged away, everything but um, the areas that are going to be printed red. So in, in the final process, you'll have your red block, your blue block, your green block, your pale blue block, your pale gray, et cetera, all of your blocks. And so you'll print one color, let it dry. You might print, if it's a popular print, you might print a thousand yellows. Let them dry um, and then start printing your oranges. Um, and print on that same piece of paper where you've already printed your yellow, possibly also the key block, maybe the key block is last. Um, you then go back and register it very carefully on your block, um, or register your paper very carefully onto the block, um, and then you rub the, um, the back of your paper with this implement right here which is called a baren. Uh, it's made of a bamboo leaf or bamboo leaves. Uh, it's very, very uh, smooth on one side. And you rub that um, over the back of the paper that is pressing into the inked block to transfer the ink to the paper. Again, you hang it up to dry. You do this 20 times if you're doing a 20 color print. Each time carefully registering your paper because if you get it off, um, it's not like the Sunday comics where it's okay if they're a little bit off. These were very much uh, precise. That would have to be discarded. So here is a block, a reddish block that is inked. Um, here is a carver who is carving one of those color blocks. So she's not using that little tiny scalpel-like tool. She's using a you know, a mallet and a big gouge because she has to carve away lots of the surface space. All that will be left is maybe a few little areas that will be a particular color. Uh, this person is sizing the rice paper because without the sizing, the colors just bleed in. Uh, so this allows them to have that crisp color. Um, and no, usually women would not be doing this work, uh, but Kudisada produced this print at a moment when the government had outlawed images called bijinga, or um, woodblock prints of beautiful women. So Kunisada could say, well, this isn't a bijinga. This is an image of uh, the professions. So he's getting around the censorship rules by having 
beautiful women working in a um, woodblock print studio. Uh, but you can see you know, some of the brushes, some of the colors, the baren, and so forth. Um, this collaborative process that has really four main components. The designer who creates the overall design for the print, the carver who carves the wood blocks, the printer who inks and prints those prints. Uh, but before any of those, you have your publisher, and he pays all of the others. He takes on the financial risk if this project flops, but if it should be very successful and be not a print run of, say, 500, but a print run of 5,000, well, he reaps the financial reward, whereas um, Kunisawa is simply paid once, no royalties, uh, for his design for this. Um, a modern woodblock print artist, Motuharu Asaka, um, made a demonstration printing of the Great Wave where he took um, what he assumed to be the color blocks that Hokusai had used. He printed each one of the 20, and it doesn't look like there are 20 colors in this work, but they're very subtle. Uh, he printed each one individually, and then he added each one uh, to the rest to create this cumulative effect so that we can see how the process works. Uh, now, in Shuncho's studio, Hokusai began his interest in landscape prints. Uh, this is a cityscape. Fireworks at Rio Goku Bridge. And you'll notice that the fireworks themselves are not outlined in black. So they're not on the key block print, they are only on the red uh, block print. And that gives them a more spontaneous feeling. Hoke size um, sense of perspective, if we look at that fire tower, is a little wonky, right? But it was something he was interested in because perspective, single point perspective, is not part of traditional Japanese art. But Hokusai was looking at Western prints, probably brought in by Dutch traders. They were the only merchants allowed to do business, you know, Europeans allowed to do business in Japan. So something like this alleyway of trees looks like Hokusai has been looking at maybe Prince of Versailles. It's very Western. He doesn't quite have the hang of it. So there's a vanishing point here, and there's a different vanishing point over here, and the walls and um, things go to a, yet another vanishing point. But he's interested in this Western art and how to employ it. Um, but the subject matter is very Japanese, the Japanese tradition of ghost stories, the macabre. So we see demons, enormous, um, enormous rats, um, and um, various ghosts. Even the step of this structure is infested by a demon. There's this crayfish. Um, critter, and then there are the terrified humans uh, recoiling from all of this supernatural uh, fright. Uh, and this, was, this is a subject that will return in Hokusai's work. But as I mentioned, uh, he was also learning to paint individual works, paint on silk, paint on um, rice paper. Uh, this is his lo lovely woman spinning silk in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So that is his training, and he spent 14 years in Shun Shou's studio, from the age of 18 to the age of 32, learning at the trade as an apprentice and then as an assistant, a, you know, a valued worker in Shunsho's studio. But in 1792, Shunsho died unexpectedly without ironing out his succession. And what followed were some months of turmoil in Shunsho's studio that ended with Hokusai being ejected.
from the place that he had called home for 14 years. Uh, as one of his colleagues, um, Shunko became the head of Shunsho's uh, operation. And Hokusai said later that it was partly due to his humiliation at the hands of Shunko that um, he was spurred on to be a better and better artist. A sense of trying to show them that they were wrong when they rejected uh, Hokusai um, and, and kicked him out of his studio. So in uh, 1793, Hokusai took on a new artistic name. No longer is he Shunro, but instead he began to sign himself Sori. And the characteristic of the Sori style is that it is very delicate, very subtle. He had some wealthy patrons who hired him to illustrate their poetry. Uh, so this is a... A kyoka, poetry form. It's like a haiku, but with 31 syllables instead of 17, and very popular at this time with, um, with the nobility, the samurai, with wealthy merchants. Uh, and Hokusai illustrates it with this dramatically cropped image of a ferry boat, where we don't even see the ferryman's head. It's behind that post. But also notice how the post sort of fades out as it approaches the top of the paper, how there's that sunset in the background. And can you see the waves on the water? They are not on any of the color blocks. So I can't see them from here, but can you see them from here? Can you see those water ripples? woodblock print, but a privately published one, not one that was going to go into a, a print run of 500 or more. Surimono typically had a print run of 100 or fewer. And they were privately commissioned so they could have higher quality material. Um, the, the paper that makes this would not stand up to embossing. Um, but this luxurious thicker paper can take on that, that subtle effect, which I can see perfectly well on my screen. I apologize that you can't. Um, so um, Hokusai in his Sori period does a lot of illustrating poetry and creates these beautiful delicate images. Um, this one shows um, a few things that will recur, Fuji a wave form and the mixing of social classes that so fascinated Hokusai. So we have children and adults, we have very um, well-dressed women and a porter, a working class man. Um, in 1798, Hokusai issued this Suribono. The only one that we know had no patron, but was rather um, issued by Hokusai himself to his circle of friends, um, colleagues, uh, business associates, and so forth, to announce that he is no longer Sori. He is now Hokusai. And the name means North Studio, but we don't think it was a geographic designation, but that the North referred to the North Star, which was worshipped as a deity in some branches of Nichiren Buddhism. Um, and it shows three turtles 
emblems of longevity. Another light motif in Hokusai's work, uh, turtles, one of which still has his head firmly in his shell, but the other two are looking up as if they are looking for that North Star. So Hokusai is now Hokusai, and he's still got his wealthy patrons for whom he is creating surimono, which are often um, sent out for New Year's greetings. Uh, so this is a somewhat later one, but I love it because it's a surimono of creating surimono. Uh, so the man is carving and the woman is printing with a baren there in the foreground. Um, and one of the fancy materials that a surimono might use is mica to give a, a glittery quality to the ink. And you can see that um, in the gold of the screen in the background. Uh, or this one, two girls making New Year's envelopes. Um, and this again has some of the delicacy of his sori period with the way that it, um, uh, it sort of vanishes into the text of the poetry. You can see that there's actual gold in the ink of the clouds surrounding Fuji in the background. Um, this particular New Year's greeting for 1800, the year of the monkey, has a double function in addition to wishing the patron's friends a happy new year. This is a calendar. Uh, imagine if every year, instead of February having 28 days, it skipped around. So maybe uh, in 1800, April would have 28 days, and maybe um, July would have 28 days as well. Uh, the government designated the long and short months every year, and they had a monopoly on issuing calendars. Uh, but here, Hoaxai's monkey is playing with a toy monkey that has some decorative slashes on the wooden um, support. And if you read those slashes from right to left, they would tell the informed viewer what the length of the months would be that year. So it was a clever way of getting around the um, government monopoly. Um, this is a, a, just a lovely um, hoaxai illustration of a poem of cage of fireflies at dawn in summer. So again, evanescent and delicate and lyrical. Uh, whereas this image was from an album of poetry called Men's Stomping Dance. So it is a little more rustic. Uh, and this one, as well as the one that I showed you earlier that had that uh, beginning of a wave, uh, this is a, a volume of poetry, an album privately published of poetry in which each poet commissioned a different artist to illustrate his work. So here, Hoaxai is competing with the other artists that have been chosen by the other poets within this volume. And that is the sort of thing that spurs him on to his best work. So we get his interest in this rustic architecture. We get his interest in the mixing of classes again from um, you know, these, um, you know, the man on the bridge who's showing us his bottom. Um, bending over uh, very humorously, no, no noble person, no person of the upper classes would be showing us their, um, their nether parts that way. Uh, here a porter, but here this very elegantly dressed uh, woman. So uh, this interest in the mixing of classes. Um, which we also see in the Craftsman's Workshop near Mount Fuji, um, which again features Fuji, again features someone bending over, uh, although a little more decorously this time, uh, but it also features the making of craft objects. In this case, this man is carving a netsuke. 
uh, and the, you know, the woman is um, working the lathe, and in the background there are surimono, New Year's greetings, on the walls of the tea house. Uh, so it's a marvelous image. Now, in addition to producing those luxury surimono for his wealthy clients, Hoxai was also involved in popular art. He was a book illustrator in Edo in this period, um, illustrating kibiyoshi. Um, so in this, um, this period uh, between about 17, uh, 87 and the turn of the century, he would illustrate some 46 kibiyoshi, which are novellas, uh, short books, often with a moral, where the text and the image share the same page. Um, so uh, that was um, over 660 illustrations that he produced for the book trade. Um, for the popular press, and this one may involve a self-portrait, uh, because we see two painters in this image. They both have brushes in their mouth, and one of them, the one in the foreground, this guy seems to be painting with his mouth. Now, Hoxai was developing a reputation for eccentricity around this time, and that is exactly the kind of stunt uh, that we can imagine Hoxai doing, painting an entire image without using his hands, uh, even in competition with another artist. So it's possible that's a sort of self-portrait. He was still interested in Western art. He made this tiny little series of um, eight views of Edo. Um, they're about, you know, they're smaller than postcard size. Uh, he called them the Dutch picture lens. Um, the Dutch, again, being the only Europeans bringing goods into Japan. And it's thought that this would have been um, placed in a sort of a viewfinder or like a little camera obscura with a lens that would have made it seem even more three-dimensional. Uh, so that single point perspective is something he's taking from Western art and also possibly what got him kicked out of Shun Shou's studio, this interest in Western art, Chinese art, and so forth. Here, he's employing a different um, uh, innovation from Western art. Can anyone guess what it is? Um, not yet. Um, look at this work, which is more traditionally Japanese, and then look at this one, shadows. Can you see that here, these figures, are casting shadows. Um, and uh, you know, these trees cast a line of shadows along the edge there, whereas traditionally shadows have no part in the Japanese woodblock print tradition, in Japanese painting on silk and so forth. Uh, so he is um, broad in his influences. Uh, this is a work that he made from his um, 1804, 53 stations of the Tokaido Road, which was the main road that stretched between Edo and the traditional capital of Kyoto. Uh, and this is a much more traditional layout, uh, no shadows, it reads from right to left, um, but it's dramatically cropped so that by seeing just the parasols, we imagine that the road has dipped sharply um, and that they are, they are lower down than these figures. Um, this idea of the 53 stations of the Tokaido Road would be taken up about a generation later by his younger contemporary Hiroshige, who would also borrow this composition for one of his most famous prints, uh, the sudden shower um, on a bridge. Uh, but this is part of a Hokusai book 
or album that he called Sumida River, A Glance of Both Shores. So um, in this album, if you could take all of the pages and line them up, Hokusai gives a panorama of one bank of the Sumida River that runs through Edo, and then he crosses over and comes back and gives, um, you know, step by step, the opposite bank. And as you uh, flip through the pages of this volume, the seasons change from winter to spring to summer to fall. Uh, now, as I mentioned, um, he is still painting on silk. Um, and um, this is a, a gorgeous example of a woman looking at herself in a mirror. But what I particularly want you to notice here is the contrast between delicacy and boldness that characterizes the best of Hokusai's work. So the delicacy in the white-on-white -white pattern of this fabric, of this um, foliage pattern in uh, dove gray and periwinkle and white, um, of, oh, the nape of her neck, the individual hairs uh, that go up into her coiffure, Contrast that with the boldness of line of the outline of the obi, this big black ink stroke, or this big gray ink stroke um, that creates the line of her kimono. Um, and it's that contrast that keeps his work so interesting. Now, around the turn of the 19th century in at Edo, a new kind of book was becoming popular, a kind of book called yomihon, or books for reading. These are longer than the kibiyoshi. Um, they're usually five volumes, and the text is printed on its own pages. So Hokusai no longer has to share his page with the text, but he gets the whole two-page spread to illustrate as he sees fit. Um, if they were popular, they would run into more volumes. So The Mountains of Husband and Wife became a six-volume novel. Um, and this is a very rustic kind of um, you know, countryside scene, but with a, with a battle, with some sort of a fight going on. Um, and these books were adventure stories. They've been likened to the Gothic novel. Um, they have elements of fantasy. So here the hero is fighting off a whirlpool, whereas up in the left-hand corner are a bunch of goblins bird-like creatures with beaked faces, uh, monkey-like creatures, strange um, hybrid forms, uh, but also note the strong contrast of black and white, or you know, off-white, the color of the paper. These are printed just with a black um, you know, just with a key block print, no colors. That would be much too expensive. So these are the popular art of their day, as really are the, the, the actor prints, uh, the woodblock prints that would run into hundreds of, um, of um, individual uh, prints. This was for the most successful novel of its day, The Strange Tales of the Bow Moon by Takizawa Bakin, which was so popular, it went to 29 volumes. Bakin was the Stephen King of his time, but he butted heads with Hokusai. He felt that Hokusai willfully ignored every one of the author's suggestions on how to illustrate a scene. 
Now, Hoaxai had his own ideas from the, the waves with their claw-like foam uh, to the dragons, to the shipwreck that's going on. You can see that this is fantasy, that it's, it's exciting, it's dramatic. And at one point during the course of these 29 volumes, the author was so fed up that he told the publisher, I've had it. Either hoax I goes or I quit. And the publisher said, okay, I can find another writer. <laughs> because he felt that hoax I was irreplaceable. Someone else could churn out stories, but these images, no. And in fact, Bakin even admitted when he cooled down uh, and agreed to continue with the series that for art, there was no one like Hoaxai. Although he was impossible, he was a great artist. And when the series was finally completed, the publisher commissioned this painting on silk from Hoaxai. It shows one of the scenes from the strange tales of the bow moon. Uh, the hero, Tommy Tomo, had a bow that was almost impossible to pull, like Odysseus. Um, it took his great strength to maneuver this, the, the bowstring. Uh, and in this scene, the inhabitants, these strange misshapen inhabitants of Onigashima Island are trying to pull the bowstring with no success whatsoever. Uh, and then the, um, the author, Bakin, uh, then inscribed the work uh, with a, you know, a, an homage to his friendship with the publisher. So this, this represents all three of the men involved with the strange tales of the bow moon. Around 1810, Hoaxai um, tried something new that he called Foolish Ono's Nonsense Picture Dictionary. So what this is, is a step-by-step -step guide for drawing various images. So up at the top, everything that is up here is also down here in order. One, the dome of the head. Two, the ears. Three, the slash of the collar, and so forth. Why would you need such a thing? Well, in Japan, painting could be a kind of a performance art. At a party, someone might ask you to pick up a brush and create some beautiful calligraphy, or to compose a haiku, or a kyoka, or to paint something. And if you were not naturally gifted, uh, this step-by-step -step guide, plus the text, which is kind of a nonsense rhyme for remembering it, you know, first the head, and then the ears, then the collar, cheers, something like that, um, would allow you to as if spontaneously, um, under pressure, and perhaps after several glasses of sake, uh, compose this image of a musician seen from the rear. It didn't really catch on, but a couple of years later, he tried a slightly different tack, quick lessons in simplified drawing, where he took geometric forms like the circle, um, and broke down drawings into those forms. So the circles are the, the tufts of pine needles covered with snow. They are the haunches of the mule and the knee joints. Uh, and they are the, the forms of the figure. And although it's not as easy as Hoaxai makes it look, this did catch on, um, this, this breakdown. You can walk into any children's bookstore today and find books for drawing, animals in particular, that are based on these principles. 1812, though, was a terrible year for Hoaxai. 
his firstborn son died. And in his grief, um, he was invited by one of his students uh, to Nagoya, uh, where his former student was now living in the provinces. And as a way of distracting him from his mourning, he took on some more students in Nagoya. But then he wanted to get back to Edo, where the action was, but his Nagoya students still wanted his teachings. So what Hokusai did was he developed and then had published his first volume of what he called manga. Hokusai's manga are simply images of just about anything he thought his students might need help with drawing. Here, a lot of fish forms. Um, and the first volume was published in Nagoya, but it was such a runaway success that the succeeding 17 volumes were published jointly in Nagoya and in Edo. And in the 18 volumes of the manga, are over 10,000 individual human figures doing just about everything um, from playing musical instruments uh, to, uh, to bathing uh, to playing board games and so forth. Um, this is volume two, uh, volume three, Hokusai breaks down a rustic crow dance. Uh, as if he's the choreographer and showing someone visually how you would do this dance, what all the various steps are, including turning around and flashing your bum. Um, some of the manga go into fantasy elements. So here we see pearl divers, but we also see a man riding an underwater stallion and another one who seems to have been submerged in a kind of bell jar so that he can see what is going on under the water. Um, so within the manga, there is just about everything from dragonfly anatomy to um, Western firearm design. Uh, that could possibly be imagined. And of course, it has given its name to the rich tradition of the Japanese graphic novel. Um, here, finger holes and a ninja dropping down uh, to, uh, to prey on a victim. Uh, so this helped to bring Hokusai out of his depression uh, and to increase his fame. Um, he also did this about the time he finished the manga. He did this uh, picture album of drawings at one stroke. Uh, each of these turtles can be created without replenishing your ink. So you might have to lift your brush. Um, some of them you don't, but some of them you do. But you don't have to dip it back in your ink pot. Um, and um, you know it's. It's something playful, uh, again, something that you might use in performance. Uh, another kind of um, instruction manual that Hokusai was involved with was the genre of Japanese woodblock prints that we call shunga. These are erotic prints that were consumed by men and women of all levels of society. If you were literate, you could read the text. If not, you just looked at the pictures. These were even given to women as bridal shower gifts. Uh, they were also illegal, so Hokusai used one of his many pseudonyms when creating, um, when creating Shunga. Um, he also seems to have invented tentacle porn. So there's that. Hokusai was also what we would call a performance artist. In 1804, he rented out the courtyard of Gokokuji, one of the most important Buddhist temples in Edo. And he had an enormous sheet of paper made. 
like about the size of this room and put ink in sake barrels and used a broom and as a performance, there were people you know, in, in the stands watching him as he painted. And they didn't know at first what he was painting. Was it a landscape? Was it a bird? And ultimately, it resolved into the figure of Dharma, the, um, the, the Buddhist monk who first brought Buddhism to the Far East. Uh, on another occasion, uh, he had another enormous, but not nearly that large, say room size, not temple courtyard size, uh, piece of paper made on which he created a, a huge image of Hote, uh, the Buddhist deity of good fortune. So he made that great big image, sweeping image of Hote, and then he painted two sparrows on a grain of rice to show that he could work at any scale. In 1817, he repeated his Daruma performance, but in Nagoya, not in Edo. And in Edo, there was so much else going on that it didn't make that big a splash. But in Nagoya, it was the happening of the year, commemorated not only by Hokusai in this woodblock print, uh, but by the anonymous artist of the print that we see on the left, where he shows us Hokusai three times uh, in the execution of the portrait. Uh, Hokusai with his broom, with his sake barrel, and giving us a sense of the scale, the massive scale, of this undertaking, uh, which the curators at the Hokusai exhibition in Paris a few years back uh, recreated for the head of the Great Staircase. On another occasion, which may be legendary, but it's too good to leave out, um, Hokusai um, was called before the shogun to um, compete with another artist. And the other artist went first and painted a lyrical landscape. Then Hokusai was up. He took his paper and took a big brush, like the one that we saw them sizing the paper with, dipped it in blue ink and made a big swoop across his paper. Then he took a rooster out of a cage, dipped its feet in red ink, and had it run along the paper and he called the result Autumn Leaves Floating on the Sumida River <laughs> and was apparently awarded the prize for sheer chutzpah. <laughs> he still had his wealthy clients who wanted their surimono, their New Year's greetings and so forth. And look at this attention to fashion. We're going to look at two surimono that he, you know, that he made for a client in 1822. Uh, this one with this delicate um, sort of pomegranate print that you know, fades, and, and he uses this bokashi technique of fading out uh, a color into nothing um, that, that has this persimmon print around the edges. Then in another from the exact same series from almost the same blocks. He's had two more blocks carved for the ecot print, the plaid of this figure's uh, wardrobe. So apparently it was important enough to the client to dress the, the, the chantress, the uh, reciter of poetry, um, in multiple um, multiple costumes, and look at her lips. Can you tell that the lower lip is green and the upper lip is red? That was briefly a fad among fashionable women in Edo, and Hokusai pays it enough attention to instruct uh, the, the, uh, the carvers that the lower lip should be on the green block and the upper lip on the red block. 
but he rarely did bijinga, images of beautiful women, because he insisted that his daughter, Katsushika Oi, could do them better than he could. Uh, in about 1831, he went back to the macabre tradition of ghost stories um, to do a series, 100 ghost stories, of which, sadly, he only completed five, but they are each one a masterpiece. Uh, this is the ghost of Kohada Koheiji, who was an actor murdered by his wife and her lover, who is in this image returning um, to them as they sleep, pulling away the mosquito netting uh, around their bedchamber to give them a nasty fright. He was about 71 when he made this image. And at the exact same time, he was working on a series, his most famous series, The 36 Views of Mount Fuji. This one includes a lightning strike because at the age of 50, Hokusai himself was struck by lightning. But he survived, and so that occasioned another of his name changes uh, and so forth, but he includes it in some of his work. Um, in the 36 views of Mount Fuji, and actually there are 46, it was so popular they, they added extras, um, Sometimes Fuji is enormous and looming. Other times Fuji is barely visible. Um, and the focus is on the people of the Japanese countryside. Uh, here, Onden Water Wheel, where we see the little boy with his pet turtle um, come to watch this um, marvel of engineering, and we see the peasants bringing their bags of grain to be ground. Uh, in Ushibori, um, uh, it's dawn. It's a very restricted palette of blues and greens to give us that sense of before the sun has risen over the, uh, you know, the, the the rice paddies, the marshes, or in the mountains, uh, where Fuji um, appears underneath the triangle of the, uh, the uprights that are supporting an enormous plank that is being cut into boards. Uh, so an enormous piece of wood, uh, we see a, a workman working, sawing from the top, another sawing from the bottom, another sharpening a blade, um, and this one in a palette of blue and brown. Uh, so he's experimenting with reducing his palette. Here we get more lumber workers at an actual lumber yard, uh, where Fuji just sort of pokes up here on the side. Uh, and then, of course, there is his most famous work. Uh, well, you might not notice Fuji at first, although it is right in the middle, and it has uh, its form rhymes with the form of the lower wave. Another thing people don't always notice when they look at the great wave are the boats plying these dangerous waters. And they are very fast packet boats that would... Um, go up and down the shoreline making deliveries, uh, delivering messages, delivering fresh seafood and the like, uh, but they are clearly in rough seas here. And it's uh, been speculated that this image is about Japan's relationship with the sea, which has nourished it and protected it, been its in, you know, in breachable barrier for hundreds of years up to this point, but which is beginning to feel threatening, where um, outside influences are beginning to penetrate the sea to the heart of Japan itself. And this waveform is one that we saw him playing with already um, as sori uh, with the um, 
you know, spring it in Oshima image. Uh, he would play with it in a series of um, Western style landscapes he made in the early 1800s, uh, where here there's even a boat cresting the wave, um, but no Fuji. Um, and he would continue with it in the rest of his career. For instance, in this image, uh, quite similar to the Great Wave, but without the boats and with the foam um, sort of devolving into a flock of white birds in his incredibly um, poetic hundred views of Fuji. And then he would make waves at the age of 85 for a festival cart. Um, uh, for um, you know, something that was um, you know, paraded through the streets on festival days, um, but these marvelous waves. So the wave, of course, is part of that work on Fuji, which was much more to the people of Edo than even Mount Rainier is to us. It, it was their touchstone, their mountain, but also a sort of deity. And in fact, the frontispiece of his 100 views of Fuji, which is um, a book, a, a two volume book of black and white images of Fuji. Uh, but the frontispiece is the Shinto goddess of the mountain, paying Hokusai's respects to her. Uh, the mountain itself was a symbol of immortality, something that folks I rather hoped to achieve. Um, and so some of the images, like uh, Fuji through bamboo, gives us that symbol of, of strength and flexibility in the bamboo um, against the immovable mountain. But he also depicted the most recent eruption of Fuji. It had happened in 1707, over a hundred years previously, so there were, no, uh, there were no living survivors of this event, but it was still potent in the collective memory of uh, the Japanese, and Hokusai depicts it as a, you know, a, a, a complete catastrophe, something that, uh, that sends houses um, into the air and people into the air, an explosion. Um, and just to give you a sense of how the, um, the landscape tradition changes from early in Hokusai's career to the end, well, this is an earlier book of views of Mount Fuji from 1771, so it's, it's 60 years earlier, 65 years earlier than these images, but it is so schematic. Whereas Hokusai can be schematic, often Fuji is just a sort of swooping outline. But when he's looking at something like, say, this village with, again, a lightning strike, um, he is interested in every, you know, in the, the details of domestic architecture, the thatching, uh, the people who are cowering under their umbrellas and so forth. There is a naturalism that did not exist in the landscape print previously. Uh, the pheasant in Mount Fuji reminds us that Hokusai was a superb bird and flower painter, even if he didn't practice that genre often. Uh, here is perhaps my favorite in this vein, his bullfinch and weeping cherry, made um, in 1834 when he was 74. So um, the 100 views of Mount Fuji, that book, included a colophon in which Hokusai wrote, quote, from the age of six, I was in the habit of drawing all kinds of things. Although I had produced numerous designs by my 50th year, none of my works done before my 70th is really worth counting. At the age of 73, I have come to understand the true form of animals, insects, and fish, and the nature of plants and trees. 
Consequently, by the age of 80, I will have made more and more progress. And at 90, I will have got closer to the essence of art. At the age of 100, I will have reached a magnificent level. And at 110, each dot and each line will be alive." End quote. So Hokusai did keep working deep into his 80s. And I want to show you some works from the last year or so of his life. He painted this magnificent ho'o, a mythological bird, something like a, a Chinese phoenix, for the ceiling of a temple in Obuse. He continued with his performance art ways because the notations on this uh, tea kettle tanuki tell us that Hokusai painted it upside down. He still had wealthy clients for his surimono. Uh, and here we get the, the utter delicacy of the moon um, against the gnarled old pine tree, another emblem of longevity, um, of, of that hope for immortality. He even created one last instructional booklet on the use of coloring, which although it is black and white, it gives in the text details on how to handle the colors of something like a peacock, its feathers, the texture of its legs, and so forth. Despite all of his hopes and aspirations, Hokusai died in 1849, his 90th year. Um, in Japan, you turn 90 um, on your 89th birthday because they count one uh, being your time in the womb. Um, but right into his final months, he continued to try to penetrate into what he called the essence of art. He didn't get to live forever, but he had already secured immortality. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? We can do this a couple ways. One is I can run to you or you can talk loudly and Rebecca will repeat the question. We just want to be sure it gets recorded. So Rebecca, can you see enough uh, to point people out? So yes, there's um, one here in the third row and then uh, farther back on the far left side from me. How did the text get printed in the process onto the paper? The text got printed in the exact same way that the image got printed. So it got written on the original drawing, flipped upside down onto that woodblock print, and carved backwards. So everything but the text is carved away. Um, so, um, you know, individual blocks you know, Gutenberg type, movable type, was not used at this time in Japan. So each character in a book like this one had to be individually carved into the same block as the image. So, yes. Uh, that's an interesting question and um, one that you will get a, a broader perspective on seeing the exhibition. Um, but it, so, yes, his work was very popular in Japan and his 36 views of Fuji was a blockbuster. 
it went into multiple print runs. And you know, eventually a woodblock will, will wear down. They just carve another one and, um, and keep printing. Or sometimes just a piece will break and they'll re, you know, plug you know, that piece with a fresh piece of wood that is recarved to look like the original. So yes, he was popular in Japan. Um, but I, th I think one thing that is really interesting is that this is popular art. This isn't, like something like this is painted on silk for one patron. It is going to hang in one person's niche maybe in a, um, a tea house or in you know, the, the niche where you enter a Japanese home, but it's going to be seen by a very select audience. Same goes with, say, the Mona Lisa. It's a portrait. It's going to hang in that person's home. The, um, the Great Wave And these, you know, the, these books, Hundred Views of Mount Fuji, um, there's no original for these. There are, it was always a print. It is always a multiple. There are better prints that are early in the print run before the block starts to wear down. There are worse prints. There are prints, you know, printed long after Hoke's death that are much less valuable, but they are always multiples. They are popular art. They sold for like what you would spend for a, a nice lunch. So they were not, um, they weren't luxury objects. And they first came, Japanese woodblock prints, first came to Europe as packing materials. The, the ones that were, you know, that were already old or, you know, maybe they were an act or print and that, that play's run had finished and they've still got, you know, a hundred copies of this print, well, they would wad them up or they would wrap statuettes or other items that were considered of greater prize um, and send them to Europe. And some artists pulling things out, you know, pulling little figurines out of these woodblock prints were like, whoa, these are amazing and began to collect the prints themselves, created a market in the West for the prints. So there was a um, Japanese printmaker uh, named Felix Brockmond who got his hands on a copy of the manga. Uh, and he began to make Prints, but also he made a he made a set of dinnerware with the, the you know with basically hoax size designs of fish and and birds and and whatnot um, because he was working for the porcelain factory um, and uh, Brockmond and his wife would exhibit with the impressionists they aren't nearly as well known as Monet or, Ma or Manet did not exhibit with the Impressionists, but Monet, Degas, Renoir, um, and so forth. Um, but they were associates of Monet and, and Monet collected Japanese woodblock prints. And if we look at certain Monets, we can really see him using the, the uh, the croppings, the daring croppings of Japanese woodblock prints, which are also part of, by that time, photography, but were not when, you know, when Hokusai began creating them, um, using some of the, the brilliant colors of Japanese woodblock prints, but also increasingly um, artists were interested in, in the broad, flat areas of color. 
um, Vincent Van Gogh, although starving, bought woodblock, Japanese woodblock prints whenever he could. He would trade paintings for them. Um, but yes, so this one. Um, you think of the famous almond blossoms by Van Gogh uh, that are blossoming almond branches against a brilliant turquoise sky. Um, he's looking at things like this. So uh, the avant-garde artists of late 19th century, Paris in particular, Paris was the epicenter, but it, then of course it spreads, um, are looking at Japanese prints and becoming influenced by them and, and using that in their own work. Um, Art Nouveau style is very much influenced by, uh, by Japanese aesthetic. Uh, there's Art Nouveau jewelry that includes dragonflies and it, it's just, it's unimaginable without the influence of Japan. Um, but it begins almost accidentally, it begins with these prints being used as packing material. And the Great Wave could have been one of those, uh, but the Great Wave was, uh, it was probably more one of the ones that was sent on once they started collecting the actual prints. And then you also start to get Americans, British, a few French, uh, but, but um, eccentric Western individuals choosing to travel to Japan and even to settle in Japan. And uh, they become, and in fact, there were some Bostoners who lived in Japan who were very much responsible for the magnificent collection of Japanese woodblock prints that is now at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, so you, you begin to have not just Japanese goods coming to the West, but Westerners going to Japan and then becoming connoisseurs of Japanese art. Um, in the far corner, yes. Oh, that's. Oh gosh, that is a really good question. How were the books bound and did they have covers that were protective? I think they had covers that were you know, certainly more like cardstock than like rice paper, but I don't actually know about Japanese book binding, so I am not qualified to answer that question. Um, I suspect it's something that the internet could tell you. Uh, is there anyone in this room who knows the answer? Someone's waving, yes. Could everyone hear that? I, I did hear a no. So, um, so the pages were very flexible. So they were, did you say staff bound? Stab bound. Inverted folded pieces of Japanese paper instead of folios. Pins made out of very tightly wound and strong Japanese paper. Oh, deck, beautiful, I imagine. Uh, so decorative color cover usually with pieces of silk at the top and the bottom. So thank you. I suspected someone in this room would know the answer. Um, so uh, yes.
so that's an that's an excellent question. Can you, um, can you go ahead and yes. repeat that? Yeah. Um, were the waves inspired by tsunamis and by the vulnerability of Japan to tsunamis? Um, do they have something to do with uh, with Hokusai's own anxieties? Um, do they change over the course of his career? And how do they compare to how other artists depicted waves? And actually, particularly this image, um, the way these waves are depicted is very similar to a certain strain in Chinese art of depicting waves. Uh, so unlike his studio mates in Shun Sho's studio, Hokusai was not just interested in the Japanese woodblock print tradition. He also trained with a traditional Japanese painter. He was also looking at Chinese art and Western art. And these, um, these claw-like waves are very much characteristic of Chinese art. Uh, now, of course, Japan was vulnerable to tsunamis. They could be devastating and violent. Um, but most Japanese had not seen a tsunami. And, and of course, there were no photographs of what, what a great wave looked like. So um, Hokusai is just imagining what such a wave might look like. Um, and so it does, his treatment of waves does change over the course of his career. This is from his, you know, his 30s, from his Sori period. And these waves are much gentler, they are much more rounded, they are actually less Chinese than the ones with the fingers. Um, and this is kind of a more original wave than the wave. Uh, but it's much less dramatic. And um, we don't know much about Hokusai's own individual psyche. Um, but we know that Japan as a whole was feeling a sort of anxiety about being penetrated by the West, about the inevitability of, um, the, of what eventually happened violently that American warships forced Japan to open to the West. Um, and there was debate in Japanese society over should we continue to close ourselves off? Should we become more open uh, to the West? So it, it, was a, it was like many periods of um, you know, technological advancement of globalization, it was a period of some tenseness in Japanese history that may perhaps be reflected in the wave and in, in the violence of the wave. Um, so, and then I did show you a couple of examples of his late late wave paintings. I mean, already he's 72 or so when he creates the great wave. Um, but he continues to make tumultuous wave forms into his late 80s. So, um, yes? Uh, yes, please. Why the black and white in the hundred views? Because that is a book. So let's see if I can. I think it's sort of that. No, apparently not. Um, so um, the color prints are individual prints. They could be bought individually. And the 100 Views of Edo is a two volume book. So as with publishing to this day, it's more expensive to create a book with color reproductions. And so um, to create this book, and indeed the, the drawing manuals and um, most of Hokusai's, you know, all of the Yomi Hon 
um, th those books for reading, those adventure stories, were just black and white because that was cost effective. So these are actually not just black and white. They are black, white, and gray. There's a gray block as well. Mm -hmm. So that makes them a little more expensive than just black and white. Uh, but to do a full color book would have been, um, again, each, instead of being, instead of each page being printed once or twice, each page has to be printed up to 20 times. It's much more expensive to do full color. So for these books, black, and you know, just to add the gray block doubles the cost of the book. Um, so that is why the books are not full color and the books that are full color are those privately issued volumes of poetry that were only made in a, a very limited number um, that were you know, handed out to someone's friends um, but, but were not mass produced. It was just too expensive to do full color. So Nan. What a fabulous question. Huh. Huh. So I'm thinking of a few things. I'm thinking of Jasper Johns's flags. I'm thinking of, for some reason, I'm thinking of pop art. I'm thinking of um, the soup can. Um, um, American Gothic. That is an excellent example. That's another work that has been parodied ad infinitum. Um, um, sorry? Uh, Hopper, Chop Suey, uh, Nighthawks, yes. Um, um, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe, um, uh, Washington Crossing the Delaware. Um, but, but Christina's world, Wyatt, um, you know, Pollock, um, but we don't seem to have one, do we? Um, there's, there's not one work that defines American art, um, or that the whole world thinks of when you think Ameri you know, when you think when you think Italian art, the Mona Lisa, the Statue of David, what else comes up? Maybe Botticelli. Um, when you think Japanese art, the first thing to pop into your head is probably the Great Wave. When you think American art, it's a little all over the map. There's not that one iconic work. Yes, that was something that I, that had occurred to me as well, a Campbell soup can, um, Andy Warhol, but yes, okay, one more question, is there? Yes. Oh gosh. Oh gosh, I did actually know what they used for the binder, but I cannot remember what it is. Um, but it is water-based ink. It is not oil-based ink. It is water-based ink. Um, the blocks are cherry wood, and what is the binder? Um, I think, again, if you, if you look up um, ukiyo-e or Japanese woodblock prints, um, it would come up, and it is not coming into my head. Um, they, they were beginning to get some Western pigments. So um, the blue, they called Beru blue from Berlin, but it's Prussian blue that they're using for the, that rich, deep blue. Um, you know, something like ultramarine is much too costly for this mass-produced process. Yes, yes, 
Um, so yes, they, they are mostly mineral pigments, but they're starting to use um, uh, developed pigments and not just naturally occurring ones. Thank you all so much.